This Week in Radio Tech, episode 235, is brought to you by Lavo and the new Crystal Clear Virtual Radio Console. Crystal Clear is the radio console with a multi-touch touchscreen interface. By Telos and the Telos VX Voice over IP Broadcast Phone System. Powerful, flexible, and scalable phones never sounded this good. And by Axia Audio and the Axia Radius Networked IP Audio Console. Throw your budget curve and meet Radius. Hey, fixing broadcast gear is difficult enough at ground level. What's it like to troubleshoot, diagnose, and repair broadcast systems 300, 600, or 1,200 feet above ground? Well, Chris Tobin advises about what can go wrong and some common remedies, and we analyze an antenna repair by Tower Pro John Hedish while he's 920 feet above the ground. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack. Glad that you're here. This is the show. We talk about everything to do with radio technology, uh, audio, RF, sometimes mechanical stuff like this show, stuff that's up high, made of metal and Teflon and brass and stainless steel up on a tower. And sometimes we got to take really expensive gear up there and try to fix it. That's going to be interesting. Uh, our uh, uh, co-host on the show, Chris Tobin, joins us, the best-dressed engineer in radio from Manhattan, New York. Chris, thanks for coming in. How are you, buddy? I'm doing well. I just got back from the CCW SATCOM show, the Expo, here in New York City. Uh, for those of you who don't know, that means counterclockwise. Counterclockwise for some and others, it actually means the content and communications world, the mm. Satellite Communications Conference and Expo held at the Jacob Javits Center here in New York City. Hey, satellite communications. Now, you know, before the Internet came along, satellite was hot because, you know, if you wanted to get audio, video, telephone calls, data, stock market out to a bunch of people and even return data, satellite's what you used. You know, in the 80s, especially, we were, we were hot to trot on satellite. 90s came along. We were still hot to trot satellite because the Internet sucked. What's the prospect for satellite over the next 10, 15, 20 years? What do you think? Actually, uh, satellite's doing very well, depending on the sector, the business uh, sector you're in. Uh, it's still, in some cases, depending on your um, industry, still the most economical or uh, cost-to-benefit way of distributing from a single point to many points. Uh, it's used a lot in emergency operations where uh, mm -hmm. landlines or we'll call terrestrial uh, connectivity is is decimated, so the only way you're going to hear or talk is through the satellite, through the sky. Uh, so you know places like Haiti, where there was you know the terrible uh, conditions there, or, or an earthquake zone, or things like that. Oh so yeah, sat yeah, and the satellite industry continues to grow and, and shift. So the latest now is Ka satellite, right? Is that right? And that's really yeah, high yeah. frequency, super super high frequency. I was looking at some stuff today, and you know it's the funniest thing. The if you can picture a, a shoebox, okay, the size of a shoebox. Yeah. And uh, a small little pie plate in front of it uh, at a 45 degree angle. At KA band, you can now put yourself on the uh, on a satellite from outside. <laughs> wow! Wow! That's how the hey. that's how the, <laughs> the tech technology shifted from the days of C band, where it would take a a uh, a pie plate the size of uh, a, a car. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, the, the antenna, size of a car. The antenna, sure. and then the actual transmission device would be about the size of a of a coffin. So that, that, that's, that's basically what you got. <laughs> Car in a coffin. Well, it's, <laughs> the times, they are changing. They are indeed. Wow. Hey, uh, in fact, we, we may touch on satellite a bit uh, during the show. And we could, uh, we've done some shows about satellite, and we could probably have another one to catch us up on, uh, on the technology. Uh, we had a guest, uh, a guy from a company I believe is called uh, uh, Caillou or KU. Um, anyway, they were, they were doing uh, you know, installations out in, the, in, I don't know, Papua New Guinea and places like that. Just crazy places that the only way you could get there was with satellites. So I guess that's a good point. Hey, our show is brought to you in part by the folks at Lavo. Lavo, maker of this really cool audio console. If you have ever dreamed of controlling an audio console from a touchscreen, well, you need to look into the Lavo Crystal Clear Virtual Radio Mixing Console. Why is it called virtual? Because there's no actual piece of hardware with faders that you move and buttons that you actually depress and knobs that you actually turn. It's all represented to you in a gorgeous, gorgeous multi-touch touchscreen interface. And that is, it, it's, that interface is simply an off-the-shelf HP multi-touch 
PC. It's running Windows 8. The application takes the whole screen, so it, it doesn't look like Windows, but it looks like an audio console. And i got to tell you, these guys at Lava, they've been designing consoles for a long, long time. They, uh, they do big consoles. They do consoles that do surround sound and just multi-channel stuff for big television productions and symphony halls and, and uh, TV stations, remote trucks and all that. And now they're doing consoles that are smaller, more appropriate for smaller venues like radio stations. And this, uh, this crystal clear console is pretty interesting. It consists of a one RU, one rack unit box that goes in a rack. It doesn't have to be close to the uh, multi-touch PC. It can be off somewhere else, although it does have inputs and outputs on it for your local sources, like your microphones, okay? It's got a couple of mic inputs. It has some line-level analog inputs and some AES inputs, and as well as some line-level uh, analog outputs and AES outputs. Of course, it has some GPIO, so you can turn on your on-air light, you know, your tally light, let folks know not to come in the room. And, uh, and it's got it, you know, the other outputs that you need, like your speaker outputs, your headphone out outputs. So that is a one RU box. It has the entire mixing engine in there. And that is where also there's an Ethernet connection. That's where you can connect to, the, to your other studios, to other gear, uh, using the Ravenna AOIP standard, which by its nature contains... AES67, the, the standard that uh, AO, AOIP standard that you've heard a lot about that's now an actual year old, yeah, it's a little over a year old now, uh, standard from the Audio Engineering Society. There's power supply redundancy also. Uh, the mic preamps are fantastic low noise preamps. Uh, there are two separate amplified headphone outputs. Uh, the console, the virtual console, features uh, three stereo mixing groups, program one, two, and a record bus, plus you know all, all the things you'd expect, uh, Q, a Q bus, pre-fader level, if you will, uh, precision stereo meters, uh, programmable scene uh, presets can recall you know, every detail. And one of the cool things, when you design a console completely in software, uh, you can have the buttons be entirely context sensitive. So if you touch an options button above the mic fader, what you get are options that have to do with a microphone like presetting the level for a particular mic or a particular guest. Uh, get their audio range just right so your, so your fader is sitting in the right range. Uh, that kind of thing. That kind of thinking has gone into the design of this console. If you would, uh, if you're interested in a multi-touch touchscreen console, I, you know, someday <laughs> everything I think will be like this. is really cool. Uh, I can't wait till someday we have haptic feedback you know, on the screen itself. I think the military has that. Uh, but Lavo is letting you just look at it and run the faders up and down yourself. They got the algorithms down really good. Check it out on the web at Lavo, L-A-W-O. It's a German word. L-A-W-O, pronounced Lavo, dot com. Lavo dot com. And look for in the radio products, the, the radio consoles, and find the crystal clear console. Oh, on the web page, there's also a short video of uh, Mike Dosh, director of virtual radio projects, at Lavo, he is uh, demonstrating how the console works. Check it out. And thanks to Lavo for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. All right, uh, Mr. Tobin, we were going to do some talking about towers on uh, this week in Radio Tech. And um, I didn't really want to talk about, you know, the, me the mechanics and the steel and the guy wires. That, that, that is a great subject, but it's not really what I wanted to cover today. I was interested in covering more of the electronics side of what happens on a tower. Some of the things that have to do with, yeah, they're mechanical, they're electrical, electromechanical. Uh, they have to do with RF. And I'm talking about antennas and feed line, uh, maybe strobe light systems. And with antennas, the interesting and oftentimes difficult problems that can crop up, uh, it's, you know, some, it's hard enough for us as engineers to fix a problem on the ground with a workbench and good lighting and good weather and no 50-mile-an-hour winds. But if you're trying to solve an interesting antenna tuning problem on a tower, or maybe there's some reflected power coming from the, uh, you know, a, a 12 bay antenna, and you don't know where it's coming from, that's got to get solved. That it, and it may take a, a person with some real skills to handle that. Let's talk about that, Chris. What are your your thoughts on uh, on the whole subject of troubleshooting up high? Hello, Chris. Is he there? I don't know. That's weird. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, you can hear me, but the video is not moving anywhere. I I'm guess relaying not. four different relays in the Skype connection. That's why. Last week there was zero. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, I, hey, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll be glad to continue on for just, just a moment with some thoughts if you want to get reconnected. How about that? I guess we'll have to give that a try. 
Okay, good. All right. So here, so I'm, I'm going to go back to Chris and ask him for his thoughts. But here, here are some of my thoughts. I said it takes a special kind of talent, a special person. And a little bit later in the show, we have a video of my friend John Hedish. Uh, he runs a small tower company here in Middle Tennessee, where I live. And John has, you know, the skills that it takes not only to climb towers and to know, you know, to be safe about that kind of thing. Thanks. Uh, but also to use uh, some various pieces of equipment that you might take up a tower connect to various places in the feed line or into the antenna and find out where the problem is. And this is really sophisticated stuff. You can do some of this from the ground if you're well coordinated with the guy on the tower. But I'll tell you what, it, it, it can be really tough working, you know, 600, 800, 1,200, 2,000 feet above the ground solving uh, what, you know, is a very expensive problem that can happen on, on, on towers. So, Chris, uh, you're back. Let's talk about the, that subject. Go ahead. I am back, hopefully uh, moving in live video in color. See how it goes. No? Yeah, there yep. we go. Okay. All right, very good. Well, as I was going to say, yes, tower work, uh, tower towers in general are definitely something you have to take very seriously. Uh, the, best, the best thing to start with is make sure you can find yourself a tower crew or a company that is uh, well-known, uh, does a lot of work, maybe in the cellular industry, so they're constantly busy, and, and you have a good relationship with because it's important, as Kirk just pointed out, that if you have the guy up on the tower working with troubleshooting and you're at the base, he wants somebody who gets it, knows it, knows, understands that it's going to take a little time to figure things out and uh, is willing to work with people on the ground when there's, uh, you know, time is of the essence. I can tell you that I've worked with a couple of crews where they knew their stuff and it was pretty easy to get things done in the bad weather at the height, heights that they were working at. So that's, that's the first thing I always tell folks. Find the right tower crew. Otherwise, you'll be in big trouble. You know, how, just how you do that might be kind of interesting. But let me ask you a question. Do you feel, you know, the, the cellular industry has sprung up over the last 20 years or so you know the 25 years ago there were barely any cell towers across the country and now they're just everywhere there's some on a hilltop just just uh, around the next ridge from my house here do you feel that the level of technical expertise of tower crews has gone up since the sailor industry has required so many tower crews and and some sophistication in in putting up antennas aiming them making sure they work properly uh, yeah, I would say I, I don't think it ever, ever went down. I think what's happened is the cellular industry as a client has made demands of the, the tower industry, the, uh, uh, the tower crews, to be uh, on their game. Because as we know with the cellular industry, I, I, any interference or any time that there's a cellular site that can't function, that's thousands of dollars per minute that's lost. So um, the, the phone companies go to great lengths to make sure that the industries they talk to or work with are on the top of their game. So, you know, maybe uh, by default, more tower crews have become more skilled, but mm -hmm. I wouldn't say the skills went away. They just, they were probably far and few, but yeah, some of the crews out there now, it's just all they do is cellular, and if they go to broadcast, it's sort of like, uh, okay, what do you just extend? How do we do this? Yeah, here's here's what surprised me. We'll, we'll watch this video in just a little bit, but um, uh, it, my experience with tower crews, realize that I worked in small markets. You worked generally in larger ones, but in small markets where I worked at, we'd hire a tower crew, and what we got was a tower crew. We didn't get any troubleshooting capability except, you know, yeah, we'll, we'll unbolt this connection, open it up, and look and see if there's water, if there's, uh, if there's uh, soot in there from a flame out inside. We'll make sure the bullet's not split, you know, where the coax is, where the hard line connects together. Uh, we'll look for leaks uh, in, the, in, a, in, a, in a coax, you know, that, that kind of stuff. But never anything more sophisticated than that up on the tower. The most sophisticated thing that I'd ever had done by a tower crew was to disconnect the antenna and temporarily put a, a dry load, a dummy load, on top of the, the coax so we could then run tests from the ground, either with a uh, time domain reflectometer or an admittance bridge or whatever it might be, uh, uh, you know, an SWR bridge. And so we could see if the conditions changed between antenna you know, determine is the problem in the coax or the problem in the antenna. So that's the most sophisticated service I ever had. But we're going to watch a video in a little while that shows John Hedish using some sophisticated gear, and I'm not even sure what it is. Maybe you can help identify it when we watch the video later on. Uh, so that's, to me, that is a really big step up where you've got some tower guys, and maybe they were available, you know, maybe they had this kind of expertise 20 years ago. I just didn't get that because that's not what we hired. Uh, you know, for me, the, en the, the consulting engineer, right, was on the ground with his uh, vector impedance bridge or, or his uh, time domain reflectometer. Uh, so how, how things changed in your mind? Same now or, or different now? 
Well, they definitely have changed. Um, I will say that even I've worked with crews the same way. You send them up, and they basically pop open the uh, the termination, and off you go. Mm-hmm. So um, I would say what's changed is that because of the increased need for mobile devices and, and those types of uh, transmitter sites, a lot of the cell com- uh, tower companies that did just basic tower climbing, basic cable assembly, have stepped up and now decided they have to do more diagnostics and work with the consultants. Otherwise, basically, they, they wouldn't get any business. Yeah, that, yeah. I, I know working with one tower crew for many years, they were strictly pretty much broadcast radio TV, and, and they got the occasional 9X job, okay? That's how far back this goes. So th- <laughs> then all of a sudden, after two or three jobs, and they were being required to certify their installations, make sure that ground connections meet the you know standards that are in the industry and everything else, they, they started realizing, maybe we need to up our game and start really going after this business. And now, you know, many, many, many years later, they're you know they're they're like the number two in this in the tri-state area for tower work when it comes to cellular. Something that uh, and we'll see we'll see if we can get get your get your video going again. Uh, something that I've noticed though, I guess a, a big change is the size of the test gear. You know, twenty years ago, it wasn't possible or it wasn't practical to take a time domain reflectometer up the tower because the thing you know weighed fifty pounds and it was as big as a suitcase. And now you've got things that are much more handheld in size, the virtually the size of a of a thick iPad. You can get oscilloscopes, time domain reflectometers, and you know various different kinds of equipment in that size of a package. You know, I, I guess a lot of what we're you know the, the ideal situation with any antenna and coax is that is that power, RF power, leaves the transmitting device. Doesn't matter if it's, an, if it's an FM transmitter, television, cellular, microwave. This power leaves the transmitter, leaves that final amplifier there. It travels up the coax or maybe in a case of a really high frequency, a waveguide. And the idea is it's not going to be impeded, reflected. It's going to see a constant impedance as it travels, hopefully smoothly, up this coax. And then it's going to reach the antenna. And the antenna is supposed to be matched or tuned such that it presents a non-reactive load at the end of the coax at the same impedance as the coax. That's the whole idea here for maximum power transfer uh, from the antenna, excuse me, from the, the transmitter through the coax and into the antenna. That's the ideal. Anything that varies from that is non-ideal. Anything that, that varies from that will result in power, RF power, getting reflected like a mirror or a partial mirror getting reflected back down to the transmitter. And that's in almost every case, that's what we're trying to avoid, reflected power. We want all that power to flow smoothly all the way to the antenna. And then in the antenna, and I like to think of antennas this way. Chris, you tell me if you think this is nuts. I always thought of an antenna as an interface between the electrical world and the atmospheric world. And, you know, our atmosphere tends to have a characteristic impedance. And so really an antenna is an impedance. I mean, it's yes, it's a it's a device that turns, you know, this the electrical oscillating wave into a magnetic field, uh, you know, an, an electric field and, and magnetic field. And to do that most efficiently, it it's it's an impedance matching device to match the impedance of the of the coax and, and the and the transmitter to the impedance of the atmosphere. I may be all wet on that, but when you look at a microwave horn that we used to use, like for you know AT and T long lines, and they had you know what started out as a as a waveguide goes up to a, into a horn that gradually spreads out and matches the impedance to that of the outside world, the atmosphere. Uh, that that's the result of the maximum transfer. A- am I all wet on that, Chris? No, 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 not at all. Actually, it's uh, that's probably the best way to put it. You're going from the electrical to the atmospheric. The atmospheric would be the free space attenuation in the air. That's that's a known constant. And yes, the waveguide is a boundary device. Uh, you know, it could be rectangular or circular, and that guides the RF signal, the, the electrical part, up, the, up to a path, uh, through a path. And then when it gets that horn, that widening space, it shoots it out and makes sure that it gets to the other end. So, so the, the point yeah. there was in, anything that disturbs that relationship, and it's really a, a, a physical world thing. I mean, you know, coaxial cable is the size and shape that it is because that's what works well. And, and 50 ohms, uh, not only was it a standard we came up with, um, but it also happens to, to be convenient for the size of parts and just getting things to, to, to work well. Uh, you know, if, if our standard was 4,000 ohms, then it, it might be more difficult to make things you know, work as well. Um, so, so 
am I right? Anything that disturbs this efficient transfer of electricity or, or of signal to the outside world, that's where our problems begin. Yes, yes. And that's when you then you start getting into after you've cleared the problem with the line tuning, because it's basically what you're doing is you're tuning the line to the antenna. After you've got that match and working, then you have to worry about the physical world outside around the antenna and what effects that has on it. But yes, the, the line tuning is key. Gotcha. So, so, and this also explains why and different antennas are different shapes and different sizes. So, uh, you know, as we as, as broadcasters, uh, broadcast engineers, we're pretty familiar with the shape and size of an FM antenna. And there are different designs, some kind of proprietary, uh, others just, you know, really well known. There's the good old, you know, the, 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 the double arrowhead design uh, that uh, um, uh, I guess Jampro uh, made famous and other companies too. There's the rototiller design that ERI made famous. Um, there and, and before we had those circular polarization designs, we had designs that were dipoles. They were, you know, dipoles up in the air, stacked up, uh, they uh, they tended to be there were vertical dipoles and there were ways of doing it horizontally as well horizontal dipoles and then I guess one of the first circular antennas was the ring stub design where there's a ring of an antenna that's the horizontal part and then just as the rings come around and come together they turn different directions one up one down and that makes the vertical component of the antenna and so what you got was a horizontal radiation and a vertical radiation out of the same piece of bent metal. Um, so that was a, an early circular design. But those all look different from other designs. Like, remember television bat wing antennas? Can you, can you tell me anything about how those things worked? How did a bat wing antenna function? Um, basically, the bat wing, if memory serves me right, it's been a while. Um, I watched one come down a couple of years back. It's basically a, a radiator, a dipole radiator in front of a, a mesh. So if you could picture, you know, the bat wing was the shape. I'm using my fingers to make the shape of a, you know, bat wings. Yeah. And that was yeah. basically your, your, your ground plane. And then you know, in front of that was a dipole that radiated against it and created the, the pattern because uh, oh, so the bat wings themselves off. didn't okay. okay, yeah, and the TV signal is, is horizontal, so that's that's what they did. Okay, and, you know, and okay. that's and that's that's what it was. So the bat wings was popular because it was broadband. You can tune it. You can do a lot. You could shape the signal because uh, then they moved. If you're in UHF, you have the slotted antenna, so it's a pole with slots in it, and the inside is hollow. And those slots are cut in certain wavelengths, sizes, uh, to, to radiate the signal out and create a pattern as well. Now, as you gotcha. mentioned earlier, antennas have different shapes and sizes due to the frequency. So the best way to understand that physical being is to look at a piano and look at the strings. The lower in oh, frequency, yeah. the larger the yeah. diameter. The higher in frequency, the smaller the diameter of the string. Same is true with antennas, the RF. RF works in the same fashion. So uh, mid-frequency, we'll call it that, FM band, 88 to 108 megahertz, is is somewhat of a you know a, a, a relatively average size thickness. Go out, go lower in frequency to say an AM antenna, and what do you have? You have two feet, three feet in width, and several hundred feet in height. Go to the other direction, and let's go to say our Wi-Fi antenna. And the Wi-Fi antenna, I'm holding a similar type thing in my hand, now becomes something about the the length of someone's hand open, and it's about half the diameter of your finger. Yeah, and now yeah. That's and, the higher frequency. So there, there we go. We just went the full spectrum from <laughs> several hundred feet, several hundred feet high to several feet wide to, uh, you know, a wavelength that FM is about five feet, six feet in length. So we just take that horizontal pole of a five foot antenna, twist it to shape either a circular thing or circle with little tops and bottoms, and there's your antenna. So, um, um, what are what are some of the things that typically go wrong with antennas? We as broadcasters, let's 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 stick in the realm of FM because a lot of the listeners and viewers to our show are uh, engineers that take care of FM stations. I take care of, of several myself, and so um, what are the most common things that go wrong in the world of FM on towers between the coax or sectionalized hardline or antennas with power dividers or end fed, center fed. Give me your thoughts on that. Well, let's see. Um, things that go wrong, and we're not not because of installation or anything, just normal operating you know, parameters. Uh, typically, depending on what part of the world, a country you're in, if you say we would say the Northeast, uh, what you'll have during the summer months is very extreme, humid, and uh, sticky conditions. And as we know, humidity, moisture is a very good conductor of electricity. So RF will find its way around that. So depending on the age and installation or the stresses on the tower and the antenna itself. You, you run the, the risk of things shorting out. And if something shorts out at a high-power FM, 
know, the end result sometimes is a black puff of smoke and a hole in the, in the antenna or <laughs> yeah. the transmission line. And then go to the other end of the spectrum if it's during the winter months and you're in the northeast or, or northwest and you have conditions of icing, ice adds weight to a, a structure. And depending on how your structure is designed and how the antenna cable transmission line is attached to that structure, as it twists, it puts stress on the wire. So think of it as like if you're pulling cable in a, in a pipe in your office or in the, in, the, in the shop or studio. You know, when you yeah. pull on it, you're stretching. So picture a several hundred feet of inch and five-eighths hanging on a, on a tower. Hopefully the hangers are holding it in place so it's not stretching. But now add ice to that and then oh. have the tower twisting. Yeah. Now, it may not seem like much, but I, when I was working with uh, gentlemen, the folks at ERI, Tom Silliman and his team once, and they, one of the guys, the tower guys, were explaining the physics behind icing and twisting of a tower and what happens. And a lot of times it takes, it's over a period of time. This doesn't happen in one season. But eventually as it's twisting and moving, you can stress the transmission line. And if you have several splices in the line or one or two connections, they get stressed. And then a leak forms. And then your hydrogen, nitrogen, that is nitrogen, leaks out. And air gets in and things happen. That's, that's the broad, you know, what could go wrong in an FM site outside of, say, a lightning strike or nearby lightning strike on that case or uh, let's see what else oh you know it's another the common thing that happens with towers that goes wrong what's that tower oh. climbers working on your tower maybe not your tower maybe on a shared tower working on someone else's system stepping on your transmission lines or bumping your stuff <laughs> and lose yeah. no I, well I, i'll tell you this uh many a couple of years ago while working at the empire state building trying to troubleshoot a problem with the fm master antenna system it was discovered that one of the transmission lines got stepped on and you know yeah, how many things are up there? There's a lot of stuff. Yeah. So you know, there, there's a perfect example. Everything's working just fine until somebody slips, hits it. The it, transmission line looks normal because it's hard to see if it's bent or damaged. And then over yeah. time, because it's a hundred kilowatts of RF going through the transmission line, oh some, yeah, something fails. You know, you never know when that happens. It's not like you, you ever notice. You know, you you brought up something. First of all, you mentioned you know the uh, 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 holding all that line up. And so let's say you're using. Um, semi-flexible coax, not not hard, rigid transmission line, and you've and it and you've got those that uh, they, what they call a kellum grip uh, that that uh, that works like Chinese fingers. Every every couple hundred feet or so, you put a kellum grip on the coax, and then and then it hangs. Uh, you know, the kellum grip is attached to the tower, and it hangs by that. Um, uh, you've got a, a and and of course. Those need to be placed strategically so that the line is supported in in a, you know several places depending on how long it is and it's equally supported. So you don't want all the weight on the flange at the the connector at the top of the coax. I've had that happen before. Um, I worked for a little station in Mount Sterling, Kentucky, and we noticed that um, our signal was just over time getting worse and worse. And uh, sometimes we were getting some after a rainstorm, we get some terrible uh, reflected power. Uh, the station wasn't all that powerful. I think it was just a, a kilowatt FM transmitter, like a Collins, uh, what is it, 8, 820 uh, D transmitter. But uh, it was just getting worse and worse. Well, we got a tower crew up there. And uh, this was my first experience with FM antennas. The crew got up there and found out that the outer conductor of the coax had broken and pulled away from the outer conductor of the connector. This is an inch and five-eighths coax. And all that was left was the inner conductor of the coax just barely making connection with the bullet that was pushed into it from you know from from the uh, from the dual bullet at the at, at, at the connector and so it was it it, it, it was uh, it was uh, mechanically attached a few feet lower but apparently you know it had slipped down and weight over the years and then here's the thing we were talking about stretching and some twisting vibration if you ever go spend some time on a tower and you just sit up there during a windstorm, uh, or just during some wind, wind will sit there and vibrate uh, the tower depending on all kinds of torsional values and, and moments and things like that. But you can get a, a tower that just sits there and the antenna just b -b 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 back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And, you know, for days, weeks, months, years on end, every time the wind blows, it sits there and vibrates. You know that's got to be doing some bad things to the coax, to the to the uh, rigid transmission line, and to the bullets as they sit and, and wiggle, 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 wiggle uh, for years, and then something bad's going to happen. And there, there you go. Well, that's Chris, absolutely right. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I've been up on towers. I've gone. Well, let's see, that was the highest I've been three hundred feet, maybe three and change. And sometimes uh, one of the yeah, one of the jobs I did many years ago. I remember going up. It was about three three and change, and I had to sit and wait. 
because one of the other guys were coming up with some tools and we had hoisted up, uh, I think it was seven eighths line for a, uh, a Marty RPU antenna system. And we hoisted it up and there were a couple of issues we had. So we had to wait for some stuff to come up. And as I'm sitting up there, you know, so to speak, sitting, you, you, exactly what you described takes place. One, the wind is blowing through your ears and around you and it's, it's very noisy. And then there's this very subtle feeling as if the earth is moving beneath your feet. Though you're hanging from the, you know, standing on the ladder ledge of a, a tower and belted in. But you feel the movement and you, you, you sort of become, you, you realize where you are and what's going on and why things happen on a tower the way they do and why tower crews uh, and the standards that they follow are, are specific to, you know, how to tighten a bolt, what's used to tighten a bolt, what type of metal is used for the bolts on a tower, uh, you know, all these methods and why would you, you know, lanyard your, your tools to your wrist when you're on a tower, things like that. So it's, uh, yeah, the environment on the tower is not as, as pristine as you might think. It is. It is not. I've I was been surprised several times climbing towers is just how much vibration and and torsional woes were going on. We were talking about wavelength earlier, and you mentioned that you know uh, FM wavelength and 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 how the higher the frequency, the lower the wavelength. I just happened to uh, on a shelf over here in the office have this. It's a KU band LNB low noise block amplifier, and this is the end that most people are familiar with. This is where an uh, an F connector and an RG you know, piece of RG six coax typically with an F connector on it will connect and take this back inside to a satellite receiver uh, inside the building. And this end is the end that connects, uh, you know, that bolts to uh, the, the the ring mount on the satellite dish. Well, if you look closely there, and let's see if my camera will do that, that little piece of white there, that's Teflon. And that little piece of Teflon is actually covering up the antenna. That's the actual antenna. That's all it is. It's, it's less than a quarter inch long. And uh, it's just a piece of metal cut to a very precise length. And that antenna goes inside. And now, Chris, would, would that be a quarter wavelength of this frequency? Is that what that antenna probably a is? KU, a KU is 14 gig. Eh, it could be. It could be a quarter wave. I, 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 it, wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a lot less than a quarter wavelength. It wouldn't have good transfer. No. Uh, so, so the, the, the big square, the big rectangular area, if you can put me on again, the big uh, rectangular area there is the way, the size of the waveguide. If, if this were being carried by waveguide, it would be that size. And then the little antenna inside there, uh, is, is what, is what transmits into, uh, energy into the waveguide or receives it back out. In this case, the waveguide is just a little short thing, um, that goes to, you know, where the, the ring is on, on the, the front, on the feed horn. Of the uh, of the satellite dish, so antennas come in all shapes and sizes. That's one of the little bitty ones. Uh, what can go wrong here? Well, not a lot, but you know, <laughs> we had a we had an episode of this week in Radio Tech years ago called "Bees in the Feed Horn." <laughs> I think we yeah. We've what, what goes one. wrong with a satellite downlink? Well, let's see. Yeah. It goes out of alignment. Somebody uh, pokes the uh, the dish. The LNB yeah, may just fail. What do you got I there? took the uh, the cover off, and you know, it's 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 a Solid block here. They, they don't want any any moisture gets in this. It's really bad. Because uh, uh, well, yeah, uh, and also you have to remember too at those frequencies you don't want noise. You don't want anything else. Because why? Low noise block converter is what it says. Low noise. You're trying to capture a signal. Now, mind you, you're trying to capture a radio signal twenty two thousand miles above the Earth's surface. It's from space. You're also putting that. <laughs> yes, it's not a comet, not not a Rosetta, but you you're, you're <laughs> trying to get it from this this little what looks like a VW bus flying in space there, you know, in a figure eight above the earth. And that little quarter wave antenna has to pick the signal out. So just, you can just imagine how much electronics has to be used to make the noise floor really low. Oh, yeah. 14 yeah. gigahertz to try and yeah. pick out that signal. Oh, and they have to, uh, uh, you know, a little droplet of water, as I was getting to, represents a huge bunch of inductance or capacitance or something. It really oh. screws with the circuitry. The circuits got to be bone dry. You can't have, you know, bits of moisture landing here and there on the circuit boards because the frequencies are so high, the wavelengths are so short, and the tolerances are so tight in the tuned circuitry that's in there uh, that a drop of water would just totally screw it up. And don't forget a drop of water at KU frequencies is the resonant frequency of the signal. So you would actually uh, wipe it out. <laughs> there you go. Yep. Yep. Just yeah, absorb all the signal right there. In fact, That's it. You, you know, you, Chris, you, if engineers mm -hmm. uh, watching, listen to the podcast here, you, you probably deal with 950 megahertz gear. 
You might deal with uh, you know STL transmitters and receivers. And if you're like me, you have found out the hard way that a, a drop of water at the wrong place inside an N connector that's typically <laughs> used with, you know, uh, half-inch coax or LMR 600 uh, coax uh, or 7 8 coax, a drop of water in the wrong place in an N connector, signal's over, game's over. You got, you know, it's awful at that point. Yeah, I mean, moisture in general, water in general, when it comes to electrical devices, in this case, RF signals, uh, mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't mix very well. Really. They don't do that very well at all. Yeah, well, no kidding. So, um, hey, I, I, I want to hit one other subject here before we go to our, our next break. And that, on the phone, you and I were talking about this issue that comes up from time to time. And I think it's typically ca called um, passive intermodulation. Is yes, that right? that's correct. Passive intermodulation. And tell us what that is. I got a story to tell about that from uh, Memphis, Tennessee, and a 300 kilowatt FM station, and the havoc wreaked there. But how would you how would you define what is passive intermodulation and what kind of problems does it cause? Okay, um, most I'm, I'm assuming I'll, I'll make the assumption, and I probably shouldn't. We'll do the whiteboard as to why you don't assume. And anyway, moving right along with that joke, uh, <laughs> passive intermodulation, as as the term um, says, it's passive. Intermodulation takes place in many things, in many devices, many circuits. Intermodulation is basically the mixing of more than one signal, you know, two, three, four, and then out of those uh, summing of the signals is a resultant third or fourth signal. That's active. That's when you intentionally are actively mixing signals together. Uh, for example, a transmitter site that has more than one transmitting emitter, one, more, one transmitting antenna. So you have mm -hmm. two FM antennas on a tower. They mix. Hopefully they are separated in such a way that the frequencies don't mix and create a third frequency smack in the middle of a TV channel. Oops. Yes, I did work at a place that had that problem. That was, that was fun. Mm -hmm. um, so then you have what's called passive intermodulation. Passive intermodulation has become more prevalent in the last several years because of the mobile industry's need to uh, have high-density cell sites. Okay, we'll call them that. And passive is a result of connectors that uh, aren't properly terminated. Maybe environmental, where you have a railing, a handrail on a staircase, and mm -hmm. the joints where the bolt of the railing connects to the wall or a support structure become uh, corroded, uh, rust. And then, believe it or not, because this, this uh, railing and the rusted bolt that's holding it to the metal support structure happens to be in the near field of an antenna, a radio signal, mm -hmm. the radio signal actually excites the corrosion. That takes you back to the early days of radio reception known as the cat's whisker. <laughs> When yes, yes, the diode. crystal radio. Yeah, that's it. Your yeah. crystal radio was a exciting device. You excited the the, the whisker, and that's well, how I, you got. I've, the I've heard that that if if you didn't have a germanium diode or a cat's whisker, you can still make a crystal radio at, using a rusty razor blade. Well, that's where I was going with this. Ah, the okay. same the same principles that you would use in the crystal radio set of the the mm -hmm. early days is the same principles that plague us today. In modern times, I'll, I'll, I'll have some fun with this. And, and, and it's, it's annoying because you can't always track it down because it's excited by a source that you don't know. I could tell this from personal experience in working with a project this past year and helping a government agency troubleshoot a problem that created all kinds of issues. And we spent months trying to find and isolate this. And if you could just picture trying to figure out where an Intimod third resultant interfering radio signal is appearing from the rooftop of several different skyscrapers in New York City. You can just imagine what we had to go through. I was on the top of the City Corp building for many months, many hours, top of the Empire State Building, on top of the MetLife Building, on top of the Trump Tower Building, on top of some other building. I'm not even sure what the name of it is, but the agencies that were up there, we couldn't talk about <laughs> what they did. And we were trying to triangulate by using directional antennas to point in the direction of the interfering passive intermodulation signal. Yeah. So this passive intermodulation signal is actually a byproduct of two other signals and created a third one. It landed right on a Coast Guard frequency. <laughs> I've heard this said uh, maybe a little bit different way. Uh, and it's saying the same thing that you're saying, but I always heard the word, and I like this word, dissimilar metals. When you have That's part two of it. Yes, that is part dissimilar of it. metals in contact with each other, you can have a, a nonlinear um, electrical connection. That is... 
electricity won't behave the same way uh, going through that connection in one direction versus the other, or in in either direction. It's nonlinear. It 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 you know it's it it doesn't have a curve of voltage, current, resistance, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it doesn't it follow Ohm's law. Varic. How about that? It becomes an unstable varactor. Basically. Yeah. Oh, there you go. That, another way to say yeah. it. So, so yeah, any, uh, yeah. It, it, what you're talking about is the same thing. There's similar metals. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's why the similar metals have the same issue. And that's why you don't do aluminum with, with steel or copper. I forget what yeah. it is. There's a different one. But when, and you'll see the you resulting build, act. When you build flagpoles, towers, uh, 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 railings on buildings, as you mentioned, roof flashing, when you, when you use building materials to make things, you end up with dissimilar metals touching each other. And you might end up with corrosion between uh, two of the same metals, but the corrosion makes it dissimilar between the two. So you've got all these opportunities in an, in an urban environment, uh, at a tower farm or a rooftop uh, location, to have dissimilar metals contacting each other. And when you have that, you have the opportunity for, if, there's, if, there, if you're in the field of, I guess it would take two, because one, you know, one signal wouldn't necessarily do it, but two signals mixing uh, on this dissimilar metal connection can very well result in that connection emitting um, intermodulation energy. That is energy at other frequencies besides the two that are hitting it, two or more that are hitting it. And so it's a, it can become a wildly complicated math matrix of how many different frequencies it could possibly be. Uh, so my, my, my quick story, similar to yours, is in Memphis, Tennessee, you've got, uh, you've got a big high-power uh, radio station there, an FM, that's grandfathered in at 300 kilowatts. Uh, I think it's 300 kilowatts vertical and 100 kilowatts horizontal. It's WMC FM. And... Um, they're you know they're far enough from the airport to for the towers to be legal, but the sig the you know the strength the signal strength is just huge, and so you have a, uh, a tower here there you had a location uh, some FAA equipment in uh, in a building and they were the, the problem was they kept complaining pilots kept complaining about hearing WMC on their aviation frequencies. Um, well, WMC wasn't transmitting on those frequencies, and they could it wasn't too hard to prove. With a, with a tap into the coax of WMC's transmitter and a spectrum analyzer, see, it's clean. We're not transmitting any energy on aviation band frequencies. We're totally legal, uh, both you know, near to the carrier, medium from the carrier, and at second, third, fourth, fifth harmonics from the carrier. Now, the aviation band is just above the FM band. Uh, I'm not sure what was mixing with what, but you know, another FM station, for example, if there was a WMC's on 100 megahertz, and there's another station on, say, 92 megahertz, and they mix together, and, there, and there's a resulting uh, piece of energy at 108 megahertz, well, that, that it's the bottom of the aviation band right there. Aviation band, 110, 114 megahertz, 125 megahertz. You can see that you can get uh, energy into that band, and it was being caused by corroded connections. It turned out it was corroded connections on uh, whip antennas that, if I'm not mistaken, that the F that were in the charge of the FAA. It was their antennas uh, that were actually had the dissimilar metal connection. Uh, but the uh, and the broadcast engineers, um, since it appeared they were causing the problem, even though they weren't, uh, they were charged with helping to track it down. And so over time, you know, stuff gets rebuilt with. Better metals, better, better, uh, you know, newer stuff. Um, hopefully, better stuff, and we get rid of the problem uh, over the long haul. But it's the kind of thing that can crop up, crop up again and again, just because it's out in the environment. Oh yeah, Sound yeah. Right? There's a lot of things that the environment destroys or you know wreaks havoc on. That's why you want to galvanize metal when you're doing it outdoors and make sure that it's uh, uh, set up properly. Well, I, I, I um, what's that? Go ahead. Uh, do, do, does galvanization last forever or for the useful life of? Whatever's galvanized, yeah. does, it, does it wear off? It eventually wears off, but depending on if the process is done right, it, it'll last a long time. Okay. I've, I've been at sites where it's been there for many, many, many years. Uh, I've also been at sites where people don't galvanize joints, and all of a sudden they're coming back a year later to rusted uh, angle iron. <laughs> it's not good. Ah, so if, if you've got a, a galvanized tower, and let's say you have one of those grounding kits for the coax, maybe an Andrew or Cable Wave or whatever grounding kit, and you... You might have a a you know a, a bolt hole in the tower. It's meant for it, but it's it's galvanized, and you you cinch the bolt down. Don't you now have dissimilar metals? Maybe yes, because uh, uh, there. And if it's not tight, um, 
a lot of times, you know, nowadays, good practices, they'll go back and, well, first of all, they'll, they'll scrape it and then they'll bolt it together and then they'll go back and spray paint over it or spray galvanization or, or spray paint over it to keep uh, moisture out over the long haul. Yes, what you do is you, you scrape off the galvanizing to make the contact to the metal of the tower. Then you secure it, you weatherproof it, and then um, they have secure, you secure it. And then you would spray a galvanizing paint, uh, a, a material, on that joint so you restore the galvanizing effect. And then you paint over it for the tower painting purposes and just for you know, uh, weather protection. I was just talking yeah. to someone today about that regarding a microwave, uh, ENG microwave receiver on top of a tower and complaining about the grounding wasn't enough and the lightning used to keeps blowing, blowing up the receivers. Then when we, uh, he showed me the pictures of their setup, we're looking at the cables. I'm like, where is that ground wire going? He goes, well, here. I was like, well, that might be part of your problem. You didn't really ground it. So you, you're, you're, your nice three foot microwave spinning, uh, uh, what do you call microwave dish, seven gig dish is basically insulated from the tower and sitting out there waiting to get zapped. Ah, uh, yeah. Sure enough, yeah. when we talked to the manufacturer, because he, he was like, no, that can't be it. The manufacturer comes over. It's, it's a today's show, right, right at the CCW. And uh, <laughs> the, the engine, the application <laughs> engineer, first question out of his mouth is, okay, you're on a tower. How high up? 300 feet. Okay. Where is this tower located? On a hill. Okay. Uh, we're here in the Northeast. Yes, it's over New Jersey. Okay, great. Um, what kind of grounding did you do? Let me see the pictures. Yeah, that's your problem. Okay. And here's why that was the problem. The connection for the RF signal of the video for the return ENG signal from the helicopter was being converted from RF yeah. uh, to, uh, to fiber and down the tower on fiber. So the fiber, you can't jump with the lightning. It's a non-conductor. Right. So he said the only other point, the only other place that the lightning could wreak havoc is where you didn't properly ground it. It was the ground cable. How, how does ground that receiver get, get power? They, uh, well, they have, I'm sorry, they have a 48-volt line that's also insulated. It's, ah, it runs okay. with the fiber in a special, is a, is a device, that, the, the device is a mechanism they use for isolating the, the uh, for, uh, transient protection. Sorry, yeah. those are the two things. Yeah. And... Okay. Um, but the thing was, he said, once you don't have a proper ground, the entire radome, the cover of the dish, the cover of the assembly, and the metal base that it sits on becomes just a, uh, an antenna waiting to be zapped. Yeah. And he, yeah. then he showed us some pictures and other examples of other client locations where they had a similar situation. I was like, well, look at that. But yeah, you can, you can galvanize the, the connection you make to the tower and, and, and restore it and make sure it's right. That, that's standard practice. You're watching uh, This Week in Radio Tech or listening to it. It's uh, with Kirk Harnack along with Chris Tobin. We're hoping that Dave Anderson could join us. Either he's en route or he's not going to be able to join us, but maybe he can in the last few minutes of the show. Dave's been on the show before, and he's done a lot of tower work this past summer. If he doesn't get it on this time, we'll get him again uh, another time. I know he was at an, an SBE NS workshop today uh, in Tampa, and so we'd uh, like to talk to him about that if he, if he does show up here. Hey, our show is brought to you in part by Tello Systems, the folks that hire me, and I really appreciate that. I also appreciate them um, uh, sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. And I want to tell you about the Telos VX Broadcast Voice over IP phone system, VoIP phone system. It's the first VoIP phone system meant just for broadcasters. Now, here's what's cool about the Telos VX system. You can plug it directly into a source of voice over IP. Let's say that you have an off-site uh, VoIP provider. Uh, you can plug it right into, into you know, in, in, into the the network cabling that that carries you to your VoIP provider. Maybe you have a an on-site PBX that is converting, oh, maybe PRI or T1 uh, or outside VoIP, and you're converting it to VoIP for inside your offices. You can connect it to that. You can also connect it to a gateway device. Maybe maybe you have PRI coming in or POTS for your on-air lines. Put a gateway device and convert those lines over to SIP voice over IP with the SIP protocol and hook that into the Telos VX. One more way, this is the really cool way that, that so many people are going with, get a VoIP PBX that you control, like an asterisk-based VoIP PBX. You know, asterisk seems like this, this big nebulous thing that we don't know about, but what we found out is engineer after engineer starts playing with asterisk-based PBXs, maybe from Elastics uh, or from Shortel or uh, maybe the one from called Free PBX. Uh, there's one you can download and play with. I've got one run, running on a Raspberry Pi uh, just across my office here, and it actually works. Uh, and it talks to the Telos VX as well. i got a line here from it. Um, uh, get familiar with this, and then guess what, Mr. Engineer? You get to be in control of your phone lines. You get to save your company a ton of money on phone lines, and you get incredible flexibility. Plus, if you do it right, 
You get higher audio quality on every call. We have had at Telos, we've had uh, a, a customer after customer tell us that, man, the calls have never sounded this good. A major television network, actually two of them, have told us exactly that. Calls have never sounded this good. We're glad to put these calls on the air. And that's just regular, you know, G.711 phone calls. You can do more than that with the Telos VX. The VX can be used as a one-room system, but economically speaking, it, it spreads well over several rooms. You can run two control rooms, uh, three. You could easily run 10 control rooms of, of telephone needs with one Telos VX engine. Uh, the VX uh, engine, if you're already a, a customer that has Axia, live wire, well, then you just plug the Telos VX directly into that network. No more money to spend except for just the phones and the, and the VX box itself. If you don't have an Axial Live Wire network, no problem. Uh, you're still way under the cost of doing individual systems in each room. Just get an Axia X node for your audio inputs and outputs and uh, attach that to the Telos VX system. And you can get audio in and out for your, your audio router. Or you can put a node in each uh, control room or production room to get uh, caller audio and mix minus audio uh, into and out of the system, as well as program on hold. Uh, there's a lot to talk about, a little bit to learn about on the Telos VX system. I will tell you this. There are now over 300 of them around the world at major networks, at small radio stations, at medium-sized radio stations. I've got one here in my office. I make an occasional phone call on. It's really cool. And if you need to access it remotely for troubleshooting, you can do that too securely. So if you would, check out the Telos VX broadcast VoIP telephone system. It's on the web. It's at the Telos website. Just go to telos-systems.com and then look, uh, well, under phones, just you know, click on the Telos VX broadcast VoIP system. Uh, it's making a lot of folks very happy because it sounds great. And you switch your phone lines over to VoIP and you can really save money, save your company money and just and end up paying for the system you know, in a, in a year or two. So keep saving money after that too. Thanks a lot, Telos, for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. All right, Chris Tobin, uh, we have a video that I would like to watch a few minutes of. Uh, sometime we're going to have this guy as a guest. Uh, he's, very, he's really busy. He's hard to catch. It's John Hedish, and he runs Middle Tennessee uh, Two-Way Service, I think is the name of his company. Uh, he's got a bunch of videos on YouTube, though. If you will go to YouTube and look up John Hedish, H-E-T-T-I-S-H, you'll find his channel. You'll find lots of videos. And uh, he's all about tower safety, doing things right. Um, and uh, the guy's just amazing. He's part of our SBE chapter uh, here in, uh, in Nashville. So um, uh, without much further ado... Andrew, can you show us a few minutes of this video? And Chris, take a good look and uh, see if you can identify what, what John's doing here. Okay. Go ahead, Andrew. Ah, okay. We're starting at, at, the, at the beginning. All righty. So he's got, oh, he's, gotcha. He's got a, a site master. That's what he's got. There, answer my own question. <laughs> All righty. All right. Here's John up on a tower. Hope he's all properly tied off and everything. Now, this is going to be like Mystery Science Theater 3000. We can just talk here, okay, Chris? We can give a, a okay. running commentary. Yeah. I, I asked for Andrew to have no, no audio from that because it, it's, a, it's a bunch of wind noise. It's, it's really wind. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm sure at that height, looking at that video, I definitely would see wind. Hear wind. Yeah. Yeah. So it looks like he's got a little strap there he's tying off that goes to a, probably his piece of test equipment is in that bag. So we didn't get to see how... It, how it's hooked up to the coax. Looks like there's an antenna bracket to the left there. Yeah, it's an Inritsu site master. That's a good product. That's a popular Ah, okay. Product. All right, now, see, yeah. in, in my contract engineering work and my current work, I've never gotten to use anything like this. So tell me about what this product does. It's basically a uh, very specialized uh, spectrum analyzer, and you can use it for tuning up your HD signals for AM. You could use it for FM spectrum. In his case, he's probably using it for land mobile purposes. So you do, uh, you could check the antenna. Uh, what do you call it? It's I can't think of the name of the technique now. Oh wow, that's good. So you can check to see if the antenna is properly working, if it's tuned and if it's shorted or not. Now, um, when when I bought a spectrum analyzer years ago, back when they were still, I mean, I, so expensive, I couldn't I couldn't afford much of one. Uh, but I didn't get the sweep generator option that came with it. But my understanding is you can get a spectrum analyzer with a sweep generator, so it will put out a signal that sweeps and the Spectrum analyzer sweeps at the same time and analyzes that signal, and you can see how a signal gets accepted or rejected by 
what it, what you're connected to. Yes, I have a uh, cell site tester. Mine is a traditional, very large, you know, size of a milk crate spectrum analyzer that I use for tuning up uh, duplexers and and filters for for ham radio as well as broadcast. And it has a tracking generator in it, and that's what we do. We sweep the frequencies in, and on the display, you'll get either a peak that looks like a peak for passing the frequency you want, or you get what looks like a uh, in a V, the letter V, and at the mm-hmm. base of the V is where it's rejecting the signal that you want. So that's 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 what you'd use a tracking generator for. And the Aritsu is the same thing I have, but now miniaturized because they can do that, and uh, it's pretty cool what you can do with that. So he's probably doing exactly that, sweeping it with the line, looking at an antenna, and seeing what's going on. Now, it, it, what, I was going to ask, why would he be doing this way up the tower instead of at the bottom? I guess because he doesn't want the coax to be part of the measurement equation. Right. Well, you have to bear in mind if your antenna, say let's just assume it's a uh, uh, UHF antenna, standard land mobile antenna, so it's a white stick. People see these all the time. And it's a white stick, so it's basically a collinear antenna. So it's literally, if you can picture segments of pieces of coax that are cut and uh, loop back and forth in a vertical position, that's how it basically looks. In there, if one of those segments shorts out, the antenna will still function, but not the way it should. Your transmission ah. line your transmission line could hide or, or mask, that is, the problem oh, because yeah. of the length okay. of the line, the standing yeah. waves and everything else. And that's part of what... Uh, that's, that's why the Enritsu product and there's other products, Agil- Agilent and others, that a lot of times now you have to go up to the antenna and look at it. You know, back in the day, you didn't have to because in most cases you oh, can go up to an look, FM. No, the rototiller, he's at, yeah, he's, got, he's looking at an FM antenna here. Okay. Yeah, the rototiller just to the left of the screen uh, down the low. That's an ERI rototiller. Um, you know, most times you can go up look at it and see if there's any physical damage. And you, know, you didn't now, have to pull it. That, that interbay antenna. line right there looks brand new. Look how shiny the copper, the, 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 the brass is there or copper. It, yes. maybe, the, maybe he had to replace some interbay line or a bay on that antenna. And now he's going back to, to measure. Maybe that's yeah, it. that's that's very possible. Um, you know, in the interbay, and depending on the design, you have ferrites that are used to tune the section, tune out any uh, interaction between the bays. But it's hard to see with the display what he's trying to do. I can't make out. Looks like he's <laughs> yeah, doing a sweep. It hey, looks like you a know, sweep. We'll, we'll have we'll have John on on the show sometime, and we'll get him to tell us about that. And yeah. it's kind of fun here to guess what he's doing. <laughs> yeah, but now mind you, you know, I've done this kind of work, and and not at that height, but. Uh, it, it it looks easy in this video, but you have a lot of things working against you at this, at this point. Picture your body weight now just hanging, and your two feet on it. And if you look to the right hand side of his hand, you see those those struts, those those pipes of metal yeah. rods. You if you can think of the arch of your foot, is sitting on that. Okay. Yeah. Not your entire foot. Not, so not from toe to heel, just the arch. Right. Right. Depending on the type of shoes you've, you're properly using, you should be using uh, you know steel shanks to help support the weight. You you stay on that little piece of metal for an hour or a half hour, and eventually your legs start to feel. Oh. Oh, yeah. I, I could tell you that it's not fun. Plus, I've at the same that. time, you're trying to work and do things. So you're 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 tied to the tower and hang, you know, you you're not flush against it, but you're. You can see how he's moving and notice it's very very uh, labored movement. It's not just hey let's move around and do stuff. I gotta believe that if you can do what he's what John's doing here, you can go fix this the the the, uh, the Hubble space telescope. <laughs> it does take a certain uh, type a, of person to do this kind of a lot of, of the same skills in, in, involved here with the um, uh, you know deliberate movements, being very deliberate on everything you do. Now he's moving away from it. I wonder why. Maybe he's got to go. Oh, he's got to go. Maybe attach some the coax to someplace. Who knows? Oh, he's hooking know. on. There's a, there's a safety line. Okay, that that's that's he the line that he should, he should have two of those. Oh. Uh. There's the other one. And then he has a third one that actually is over his shoulders so that in the, if, if, he has, if he drops, uh, if, something, if he slips, it grabs him. And you'll see it. I saw the red lanyard. That's the one on the right-hand side. That's, that's what they, it came over his shoulder in one of the earlier shots. Okay. That's because that's what I have on my climbing belt. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I, I got some heat on Facebook for not having... Uh, proper climbing gear and uh so i got proper climbing gear last time i climbed the tower was at two two of those that's a great knee shot there john that's just <laughs> awesome i guess that's a that- uh, helmet cam yes yes he he's got a, a gopro he's loving the gopro cameras and and he's loving doing these videos there's just a ton of them on 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 youtube 
You, you know, if I didn't have so much to do, I this to me, this is entertainment. I could, and, I, and it's nice hearing what John says. I, I, I asked Andrew not to do the, the audio because it's just so much wind noise that it's, uh, you really got to pay attention to hear what John's saying. Uh, a few of these, I think he's gone back and narrated them after the fact. So you don't have all that noise. Yeah, it, it can be very noisy up there. Definitely. Wow. Yeah. Well, yeah, it looks like it's I, I a wanna, good day for him. Uh, and and th that's probably somewhere in, in Middle Tennessee. And I got to, it's a beautiful part of the world to climb. I know there's lots of places that are green and pretty and have lots of trees. If, yeah, there's places if you, in, 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 if you look down at when his feet, when they show his feet, you'll notice his, his entire body weight, now and gravity's working with you, is on the arch of his shoe. So I'm just saying that because I've done this and I, I applaud people who do tower work. It is not easy. Especially if you don't do it very often. That's when you, you really don't well, have no. the muscles yeah. to support uh, what you're doing. Yeah, so every, every, yeah you, 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 you get a really good workout. I will tell you that. You will find out you have muscles you didn't know existed after you've done a oh. tower climb for a day. I, I, John here, I, I don't think I'm speaking out of school. I, he, is, he is either 70 years old or close to it. And this man is fit as a fiddle. Oh, yeah. I used to have a guy who used yeah. to do towel work for me uh, years and years ago. He was 70, he was 73, still climbing the tower. And you watch him go up. And if you didn't know, if you didn't meet him at the base of the tower when he started, and you just happened to come to the job after he was halfway up, you'd swear he was a young guy. You'd watch him go up and spin around, not spin, but move from side to side on the, on the tower face and move up and down. And then his son who worked with him was, uh, I think, 55. <laughs> It was like, and when they came down after the job was done, people would look around like, "You, that was you up there?" And the guy's like, "Yeah, what's what, what's the matter? Am I uh, too too old?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, but it, 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 if you stay in shape and keep your wits about you, and and uh, you know, there's no reason why you can't do it. And yeah, he's doing a sweep. It looks like that's a sweep pattern. I recognize that from my my uh, unit. So it, it's kind of a, it, it has a dip in the middle. It goes down, and yeah. that's is that where things are resonant. It could be a, he could be looking for resonance, or he's looking to see the rototillers typically are not center frequency. That's intentional. Right. right. And the reason it's intentional is because of a detuning of a, of icing on the antenna. Now, I'm not sure in that part of Tennessee if icing is a con is a concern, but oh, it I know is. in the yeah, northeast. I know in the yeah. northeast they purposely tune it off frequency just a, a little bit. Wow. Oh, there's well, a transmission line that's unterminated. Ah, there you go. There you or go. That, and it, there's and something stuck. Okay, so he's at the, it, it must be a center-fed antenna. He's at the center point of that antenna because I've seen, you know, there's, I've seen hard line that goes above. We see bays below. He's at the top of the coax. So this has to be the center feed of, of that antenna. It might be a six or eight bay antenna. Who knows? Um, and, uh, yeah, but the ERIs typically have fed from the bottom. That, that transmission line didn't look like it was part of the antenna. Oh, I've, I've, I've seen. No, 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 no the, the, the black isn't. But, oh, but yeah, yeah. From oh, the no, the bay, other one, yes, yes, that's right. Yeah, but I've, I've I'm assuming the bays are turned off at the moment, right? I thought I'd seen center fed ERIs. I, I mean, I, I guess you're right. They're they're much more commonly uh, bottom fed. But if the if the power is high enough, you want to feed them in the center, don't you? It depends. Yeah, I, I take that back. It, it depends. But the black you know, the black coax is not part of the antenna. Ah, there it is. There's the I, I just saw it. There was an adapter yep. on the bottom of the uh, somewhere he's on the bottom of the center point of the antenna, and that adapter. Um, there you go. Adapts, yeah, the inch and five eighths or whatever size it is, down to the N connector. To the end, yeah, yeah. There it is. Oh, it's it's uh, oh, it's three and an eighth. Oh, okay. There you go. So yeah, the so distance, that, 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 that camera made it look like the cable was smaller. So that's what it was. Got it. Well, the cable still may be inch and five eighths, but that input connector that's that's a three and eighth inch connector, right? There. Unless it's unless it's two and a quarter, and I'm but of course it's off yeah. the screen. I just can't hardly see it. Well, I kind of like this play by play. <laughs> Oh, look, at the inside, look at the ins look at the inside of that that center conductor, that Teflon, pretty black. Uh, oh, oh you mean on, on the top of the coax? Yeah, I didn't. I didn't on the top of the coax, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Really, uh, well, that well, nice. look at the. I mean, the antenna's been there a while, but the inner bay line is new. That's what I said said earlier. I now, wonder. I like wonder if this if this was a catastrophic failure of something, and uh, it, that's why you. he's changing this out. I'll bet you it was. I'll bet you it was. Yeah. All right, guys. Oh. Three, that was a three-inch three flange there, it said. On, uh, there you go. Okay, it, it was, well, three and an eighth. All right. Hey, uh, our show is brought to you in part by, by friends at Axia Audio. And I want to tell you about Axia Audio and their consoles. Uh, I, I just visited this really cool place in L.A. Um, I visited a place called Dash Radio. Now, now uh, uh, you know, don't, I know I can't give you a lot of websites here. Sometime in your free time, you might want to check out dashradio.com. Uh, it is a... 
It's an online. Uh, they have 60 channels of, of streaming audio, all kinds. Of, you know, they kind of specialize in hip hop and new rock and you know, a lot of stuff that, frankly, I'm unfamiliar with nowadays. Uh, but they have a great uh, iOS app. Well, Dash Radio is, uh, was the brainchild of DJ Ski. I don't know DJ Ski. Got to meet him, though. Really cool guy. And uh, also a guy named John Halterman, who's the uh, operations uh, director there at, at, uh, at Dash Radio. These guys are using Axia consoles. They have two uh, rooms that they use for live productions. They have a big Axia Element console uh, in one room, and uh, they get they do all kinds of fun talk shows and talk about music, talk about life, uh, and uh, that you know those shows air on, on one of their channels. They've got another smaller production room uh, that they do go live from from time to time. They also do production there, and they have an Axia Radius console in there. And uh, the place is just great. I, it's just delightful to, to see people. And these guys aren't in the licensed broadcast business. They're in the streaming business. So what I'm getting at is content creators. Content creators, no matter where you're going with your content, how you distribute it, um, you need equipment that's reliable. It works. It works just like secondhand. And um, you, know, just, 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 you can just expect the way it's going to work. You don't have to fiddle with it and diddle with it. It's just going to work for you. And that's what the folks at Dash Radio like about their Element console and their Radius audio console, both from Axia. And guess what? They talk to each other. One cable. One cable between them from the trunk ports. On, uh, on, on, they have a power station there, and they have the, the core uh, 32 for the uh, radius console. And just plug them together with a piece of Cat6, and all of a sudden they're talking to each other. It's really cool. And I got some of these consoles myself uh, at our stations in American Samoa. Uh, I got an Element console at our station in Greenville, Mississippi. And I just love these things. Uh, Andrew Zarian's got a, a radius console there at, uh, at his place there at the GFQ network. One of the best things about these consoles, if you're going to bring in people remotely to talk, to laugh, have fun, comment on things like Andrew does, like other podcasters do, you're going to want your console to handle mix minus. That's a big problem because so many uh, people get into producing shows and they don't know what mix minus is. And they have all this echo going on. It's just a mess. Well, Chris Tobin can uh, can uh, uh, certainly attest to this. I can too, and other guests of, of Andrew can too. The audio is always perfect. I never hear myself back in my earphone. I always hear the other guests and hear Andrew. Um, uh, it, it's just amazing the way that the Mix Minus works on this console. And you may think, Mix Minus, Mix, I've never heard of that. I don't know how it works. Is it important to me? Yeah, it's real important to you. If you're going to talk to anybody on the phone, on a codec, on Skype, uh, even people in the studio, you want the back feed, whether it's an actual Mix Minus feed or a mix of everything feed, you want that to be right. And Axia consoles do that automatically. It's one of the big features, and it was a really innovative feature when it came out uh, about 11 years ago. And it still is today because it works so perfectly well. It's just amazing. Uh, I'd like you to check out these consoles. Uh, if you need a small console for your podcast studio, for your streaming audio radio station, for your broadcast station, for your TV station. Yeah, there's Element consoles in TV stations uh, running audio for newscasts and programs and local productions. They work just great for that. Check it out, axiaaudio.com. I'm so excited. I, I hope you can tell. I'm so excited about the technology because it just freaking works. Uh, man, axiaaudio.com. Good stuff. All right, Chris Tobin, this has been episode number 235. Any closing thoughts about solving, identifying, solving problems on towers way up there in the air where you can't get to them easily? Uh, well, I guess you have to be uh, take a methodical, measured uh, approach to your problems. So if you're an FM station and you're having um, issues with your signal and you think it's a tower-related issue, I guess the first thing to look at is your reflected signal. See if it's yeah. modulated with your carrier. If it's modulating with your carrier, odds are you have a problem with the antenna itself. Check your nitrogen tanks if you're doing nitrogen to pressurize the line. See if uh, there's a pattern to, if, if you're making uh, weekly measurements and keeping track of the pressure. Look to see if you're noticing a dip or rise in pressure depending on the weather. Because as, as the days get warm and cold, the, the cable contracts and expands. And if there's a uh, slit in, in the transmission line, when the cable expands, it'll seal up and the pressure will stabilize. When it gets cold, it'll open and you'll lose pressure and your nitrogen tank will start to deplete. Or if you're running mm. a uh, compressor, then your compressor alarm should go off saying, hey, I'm running continuously now for the last six hours and I shouldn't be doing that. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. Those, yeah. Those are the early, like, that's the early onset of what could be going wrong if you want to, you know, uh, get an idea of things. 
And something else, if you happen to be listening to your FM signal and you're hearing crackling sounds, and you know it's not coming from your uh, audio transmission, your audio. your audio line, odds are your antenna elements are arcing. So you, oh. you definitely want to... Yeah, it, yeah, I was. Yeah. I worked at a station. Worked, yeah, I worked with a station that was uh, hit by not directly hit by lightning, but you know, Corona discharge was nearby, and it shorted one of the bays in such a weird way that is a uh, there's an insulator across the ring of the bay that uh, it carbon it carbon dif- built up, and so it just started shorting. And as the station was modulated and the signal was going, uh, <laughs> it, it oh, just, yeah. it just and the moisture in the air would, would affect it. So at night, when it got real dry, it was like, what the heck is that sound on the radio? And uh, we went out to the tower site with binoculars, looked up at the, uh, the bays, and you could see a little flickering light. Oh, never good. <laughs> the bay yeah, No, never, never good. Sort of like St. <laughs> Elmo's fire on a, on a yeah. winter day. You know, that reminds uh, me. I had a station that we could hear crackling on the air, and it, tur- it was after a storm had gone through, and nobody had noticed. But it turned out that one of the guy wires had broken. <laughs> Ooh. And it was it, it was the guy wire that went above the FM antenna. So, um, uh, and and I don't know if it was done right or done, I mean, it, it, I don't think it had breakup insulators. I, I know it wasn't Philly strand. So I think it was steel guy wire, now just flopping around and hitting some of the antenna bays. And whenever that would happen, of course, it would it would it, oddly enough the, the transmitter didn't seem to care, uh, but you could hear you could hear this noise on the air, uh, and, and uh, oh, in fact. It was also because of that arcing was making all kinds of spectrum up and down the FM dial and above. It was oh, knocking that's out known the as a spark gap sat- transmitter. Yes, it, it was knocking out the satellite receiver. When, whenever the yeah. wind would blow and it, it would start really crackling, the satellite receiver would go out because I'm sure there's all kinds of who knows what kind of RF being being uh, produced right there in the area, right near the satellite dish. I mean, just a couple hundred, four hundred feet up or so. Well, yeah, so, you yeah. Just basically you're you're creating wide band noise, ultra ultra band, ultra wide band noise. So the uh, satellite downlink, which is what three gig, three point seven gig, three point four gig, yeah. wide so band noise. Remember the satellite signal is what? How many microwatts? <laughs> <laughs> and, and how many how many volts per meter is the spark gap transmitter above it? <laughs> Much bigger than I can show. Yeah, pretty huge. <laughs> exactly. So you're just swamping that little that LNB it was just like, yeah. what the hell is that? Yo, know, it was fun. the troubleshooting actually was pretty. And we stood around inside the building, you know, scratching ourselves for a while. It's like, oh, what what could this be? Finally, I I don't know. I went outside for some reason to have that, heard a noise, turned around, looked at the tower, thought. Well, there's the problem. Right there's your problem right there. You guy wires hitting the FM antenna. <laughs> so. uh, no, no, nothing beats getting a phone call at, uh, you know, at the, what was it? One a, was it 1 a.m.? Midnight? Around, yeah, around that time. From your local uh, police department telling you that uh, your tower is on fire. Can you come down <laughs> to the transmitter building? We don't know what to do. I'm like, the tower is on fire? It's made of metal. Non-flammable <laughs> paint. Um, <laughs> are you sure? Because there's no grass around. We have gravel... 200 feet around the building. Um, what could possibly be burning? I don't know, but it's vertical, horizontal. It's all over the place. I'm like, okay, this is really interesting. I'm on my way. I get down there. And mind you, this is an interesting look. You know, you're driving down the street. You see your tower. It's a 475-foot tower, and the tallest structure nearby is about two stories high. So you get a clear view of this for several miles. And I, believe it or not, I see what looks like flashes of light coming off the vertical parts of the tower and some of the horizontal guy anchors. I'm like, what the devil? It turns out to be a very dry night. It was a light dusting of snow. And um, as it was described to me when I went to the, uh, one of the schools and talked to the uh, physics teachers, it's a form of St. Elmo's fire. Hmm. So it was I static. The, the RF yeah. signal from the AM station, it was a you know, yeah. AM station, five-eighths waves. So there was a lot of current there. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. So the snow and the, the, pe- the water pellets of the snow flakes, as they brushed along the, the metal structure, got uh, ionized. It was, the air was dry enough that there was, uh, there, was, there was no insulation. The air wasn't damp enough to create. So it was just perfect conditions. And I kid you not, it was just like sparks everywhere. <laughs> it's like, look at that. Fire department was just about to slam in the door with the axes. When I got there, I was like, oh, thank goodness I got here in time. <laughs> what are they going to do? I, Aim the hoses under the f- tower? They had fire hose at the door, and I'm like, oh, there goes the Continental. <laughs> oh, no. Well, I'm glad you stopped them. 
And so I've, I've uh, hey, I've, I've never seen St. Elmo's fire on a tower, uh, luckily. So um, I haven't, haven't seen that going on up there, but I'm, I've, I've heard stories and seen pictures. And yeah, that was the only time I, I witnessed it. That was the only time, but I would say it was fun. It was interesting at 2 o'clock in Chris, the morning. We got to go. This has been fun. We're going to have John Hedish on, I promise you, on some future episode. He will join us. We'll get Dave Absolutely. Anderson on. He was probably stuck in traffic in uh, Tampa. I know he had a tough way to go to, to try to get home to join us. So we'll have him on another time. But thank you for being here and, uh, and your play-by-play commentary on the tower climb and the troubleshooting and your good advice on, uh, on towers and solving problems when they're way up in the air. Maybe what I'll do is if we have John on, I will see if I can arrange. I'll get my, my gear on. And hang from the base of a tower here in, in Manhattan and just do the show from there. <laughs> sure, you uh, wouldn't be the craziest place you've done one. <laughs> That's true. Hey, our, our show this week in Radio Tech has been brought to you by Lavo and the Crystal Clear a virtual radio console. Thanks to Lavo. Also, Telos and the Telos VX voice over IP phone system. It is amazing. Save you money. Sounds fabulous. Also, it does HD voice. I didn't get to tell you that. Check it out on the website. And also Axia and the Axial line of audio consoles, including the beautiful, big, honking element console and the cute little radius console that just does all kinds of good stuff, too. Axia Audio on the web, axiaaudio.com. Thanks for joining us. Thanks very much to Andrew Zarian for producing tonight's show, and uh, we hope you'll tell your friends about us. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and we'll see you next time on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>